everybody at uh, one o'clock news, so we'll just make a start. Welcome to uh, the third and final Orkney Soil and Nutrient Network Farm meeting um, based at Lycan and Sandwick and Orkney. I'm Graham Scott and I work for the SEC in Kirkwall and I'm joined today by Dr David Lawson, who is a grassland specialist based at SEC in Perth. David's areas of expertise cover all aspects of grassland agronomy, ranging from agricultural production for livestock to renewable energy production and bioprocessing. And also today in the background, we have Malcolm McDonald from the Inverness office who is running the IT in the background. And he's going to move the slides on for me as well. So next slide, please, Malcolm, if you could. So the agenda for today, well, the first and second meetings, we discussed the chemical and physical attributes of a supposed healthy soil, which uh, meant we covered pH levels, phosphate, potash, magnesium, calcium, and we covered the physical side of the soil as well, the structure. Um, we spoke about compaction and alleviating it and so on and so forth. This webinar, this final one, we're going to um, discuss the role of soil biology in the context of, of a healthy soil. We're going to speak about what's living in the soil and um, how does it contribute um, to what's happening in the soil. And we'll include an assessment of some of the fields at, at Lichen. Um, we'll assess it uh, as an indicator of, of good soil health. Um, I'll then pass on to, to David then, who will speak about grass physiology and sward species. And he'll talk a pretty bit about the mixture used at Lycan and some novel species that, that's been added into the mixture recently. Next slide, please. So the soil, what's in the soil? Um, you can see from the diagram there that a healthy soil by volume would contain about 45% mineral particles. That's the sand, silt, and clay component. Over and above that, there should be about 25% water and 25% air, which leaves this remaining 5%, which is what we term organic matter. And this 5% organic matter um, fractions, all the living or what was once living material, and it's rich in carbon. In a healthy soil, this 5% organic matter fraction would be composed mainly of humus. Possibly up to 80% of it could be humus. And humus is the organic matter. When it's fully broken down, it's very stable. It's good for enhancing soil's ability to hold on to nutrients and prevent them from leaching from the soil. It's really good for soil structure. And it's dark in colour, so it helps the soil to warm up in the spring. The next biggest fraction in this organic, um, in, in this 5% of organic matter in, in this total soil, is the organic residue, such as straw, fermier manure, any decaying plant materials, any green manure, and so on. These are being actively decomposed and broken down by all the organisms that are living in the soil. And then the, the final um, component of organic matter is the actual living organisms themselves, and they'll maybe constitute only 5% of that organic matter. So it's a very small percentage of the total volume of the soil. Next slide, please. So the soil organic matter, it's really fantastic stuff that adds to the soil's fertility and enhances the physical, chemical and biological properties of the soil. It's critical to the soil health. And as I said before, it's, it's rich in carbon. The soil organic matter, it provides a major food source for everything that's living in the soil for all the organisms. It improves the soil structure, it makes it more friable, it reduces compaction, and enhances its workability. It also improves the infiltration of water and improves the water holding capacity of the soil and improves the drainage as well. It also, it'll reduce compaction and the chances of capping and erosion as well. Over and above that, um, it adds to the cation exchange capacity. 
when it's broken down into its humus form, which means that chemically it holds on to nutrients and stops them from being flushed out of the soil profile. Um, as I mentioned before, it's dark in colour, helps the soil to warm up, and very importantly and topically as well, it acts as a carbon source, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Crop residues are a major source of organic matter, and any land that's long-term arable crop, um, particularly if the strass removed and no replaced, um, that would have a tendency to have a lower soil organic matter compared to the likes of grass. Next slide, please. The soil biodiversity. So this is a table that lists everything that you're likely to find in the soil. And some interesting facts are that a quarter of all species on the face of the earth exists in the soil. There's more soil organisms in one teaspoon of soil than there are human beings on the face of the earth. There could be 13,000 different species in a hectare of your soil, in a hectare, in a, in a hectare any, of any field. And there could be two tons of living organisms in one acre of soil. So it's staggering what there really is below our feet. Um, it's the organisms are really responsible for all that's good in the soil. There's been recent advances in science that's enabled the detection of more and more species that's always been there. There's new species discovered the whole time. So what did they do? Well, they broke down the organic matter and, and incorporate it into the soil to improve the soil stability. They create aeration, they can uh, suppress disease and the prey on crop pests, and they help, very importantly, the nutrient cycling and release nutrients that plants can't use. This is called mineralization. Mineralization is a term you often hear about. It's in soils, it's really the decomposition of the chemical compounds in organic matter, whereby the nutrients in these compounds are released in soluble forms that are available to, to plants. For example, microbes will break down forms of nitrogen that are unavailable to a plant, and they'll break them down into the likes of ammonium and nitrate, which can be absorbed by the plant. Immobilization is another term, it's the opposite of mineralization. It's the conversion of compounds into forms not accessible by plants. And immobilization of nutrients tends to be done by bacteria. And the mineralization and the mobilization happen continuously and naturally um, in, in the soil the whole time. Uh, next slide, please. This is it's a bit of a um, confused diagram, that, but it really attempts to show you the relationship between the different uh, types of uh, microorganisms that's in the soil. It's from SAC Technical Note TN721. And organisms, as you'll know, they can range in size for tiny single celled bacteria, only identifiable with cutting edge scientific techniques up to earthworms and slugs and beetles that we all know that we can see with the naked eye. And they're all interlinked, as I said, in what's called the soil food web. Uh, next slide, please. And, yeah, this is uh, yeah, a more palatable version of the previous slide, really. It's, um, it just simply shows the chain of dependency, um, whereby um, a movement or nutrients, I guess, from through the plants, through the tiny microbes up to um, birds and, and some of the bigger mammals. Next slide, please, Malcolm. Yeah, that, this is, I think it's important to mention that the organic matter from the dead plant material and fermented manure and slurry, they're not the only source of food for the soil microbes. Um, as you'll know, plants take in carbon dioxide for the air and they convert it into simple sugars. Um, the plants themselves then convert these simple sugars into a whole wide array of different compounds. Many are used by the plants, but some are released into the soil through the roots. And then the microbes in the soil, they feed off what these root exudates, as they're called, simple sugars. Um, and these root exudates, they could be one of the main sources of carbon, of food for the microbes. 
and the microbes in return they release nutrients from the soil for the plants to uptake and the, the microbes will follow the roots the microbial activity also drives the process of soil aggregation improving structural stability aeration infiltration and water holding capacity um, and i should say too the mi microbes that's just a loose term for anything that it's microscopic, you know, anything that you can't see with the naked eye. You should have said that before. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'll just run through the different categories of organisms in the soil. I guess the most important ones, the fungi. Um, the fungi, like bacteria, are important decomposers for organic material. They convert hard to digest organic material into forms that other organisms can use and they, they increase the humus level. Um, they produce microscopic cells that grow as long threads called hyphae, which push between the soil particles and the roots in the soil. And a single hyphae can grow several meters long. And these hyphae, they can form thick masses called what they call mycelium. Um, a fungal dominated soil is really um, it's considered to be the, the best type of type of soil because they provide a continuous and sustainable release of nutrients that the bacteria don't do. And next slide, next slide's just simply an image of the fungal mycelium. This is this wave of mass of mycelium. Uh, next slide again. And there's a category of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi, which are really, really important. Um, mycorrhiza it's really a symbiotic association between a plant and a fungus the plant you see max sugar through photosynthesis and it supplies them the plant yeah the, the plant makes the sugar via photosynthesis and it supplies them to the fungus through the roots and the fungus as i said before in return supplies the plant minerals and um, nutrients such as phosphorus for example it's taken for the soil and um, the fungus really acts as an extension of the root system in that way it's a two-way relationship and it's it's quite complicated and clever too because the plant can specifically attract microbes that will mineralize the specific nutrients that it requires and um, which is which is quite clever and um, so they're providing these these fungi or mycorrhizal fungi as they're called to provide a, a secondary root system for the plant and um, so that's all very well but when we apply or when somebody applies too much fertilizer this can break the association between the microbes the mycorrhizal fungi and, and the plant and when the the bagged fertilizer disappears and the plant needs the the minerals to be supplied by the microbes again they aren't able to do that. The link breaks, if you like, and then um, they can't receive the same organic um, nutrients as they did before the bagged fertilizer was was applied. There's been research done in Aberdeen University to discover the form of signaling between plants um, using these uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Aphids attack the field and then um, signals somehow were transported through the mycorrhizal mycelial network for one side of the field where the aphids were damaging the crop to the other undamaged side and this triggered a defensive response by the plant and the scientists discovered that it was the mycorrhizal fungi uh, in the soil that was that was um, transporting this information from one side of the field to the other which is quite clever uh, next slide please Bacteria, um, yeah, bacteria are present in massive numbers. There could be a, a billion bacteria in a spoon of soil, the equivalent to the weight of two coups per acre. It's hard to believe. Um, examples of bacteria in agriculture, you'll know the nitrogen fixing bacteria in clover. It's the bacteria that, that uh, is fixed to the roots that converts the nitrogen gas into a form that the, the plants can, can take up and use. Um, there's actinomycete bacteria, which decomposes hard to break down materials like cellulose. And actinomycete also gives soil its earthy smell. 
and then there's microfion bacteria and um, these are clever little beasties that change ammonium to nitrate and nitrate's the preferred form of nitrogen for for gases to, to uptake nitrogen from uh, next slide please uh, nematodes in the soil um pcn that's your potato cyst nematode your csn your cereal cyst nematode that's really the baddies if you like um PCN at the EO1 serial cyst nematode. Um, not all nematodes are bad. Um, a lot of them feed on bacteria and fungi. Um, some of them feed on themselves as well. When the, um, when the nematodes eat a bacteria or a fungi, ammonium is released. Um, and it's important, well, the nematodes are important, like a lot of other, other organisms, in releasing nutrients into and plant available forms. And next slide, please. Say a little bit about protozoa. Um, so you can see they're single celled organisms that eat mainly bacteria and they play an important role as well in mineralizing nutrients or making them more available to plants. Uh, protozoa, if you're interested, there's three different groups of them uh, depending on their shape. The ciliates, these are the ones with the fine uh, hairs on their bodies, which uh, they use as ores to pro propel themselves through the soil. There's amoeba, and <clears throat> they move by extending a funny little foot like um, part of their bodies that propels them through. And then there's flagellates, which have a whip projection that they fly through the soil using. A bit of useless information there for you, but that's the protozoa. Uh, next slide, anthropods. Um, these are all the bugs with legs and no backbone. And uh, I've heard it described that they, they're like can openers in the soil. Um, they range from being microscopic to inches in length, some of them. And it includes beetles and millipedes, spiders and springtails and ants as well. And they shred a lot of the organic ma um, material. And they really enhance microbial activity and again they mineralize a lot of the nutrients and excrete forms available to plants and they also help the soil aggregation aggregation and the control pests as well so they're very important as well and the next next group next slide please this uh yeah earthworms um we all know about them the abundance of earthworms would historically be considered the, the main indicator of good soil health and um, they break down organic material and they spread the uh, aggregates through the soil profile they create tunnels which helps aeration in the soil and drainage and they also enhance microbial activity and um, they take nutrition from the bacteria and fungi in the soil organic matter and um, many of the microorganisms in a worm cast um, they actually multiply up the micro microorganisms the digestive process the, the worm casts contain more microorganisms and they actually eat so they multiply up the microbes in the soil the worms so, yeah they're good for enhancing the biological activity as well as doing all other good things it helps the soil structure and next slide please um by digging by simply going into the field with a spade and digging a a spade width and 20 centimeter cube if you like a soil and counting the worms gives you an idea of the biological health of your soil and um, if you're finding more than nine worms that's considered to be very good a very good sign of soil health if it's less than three it's considered to be poor and um, you'll find that fields that have been cropped continuously for barley for example they can have no worms in them in them at all and um, the three major groups of worms um, and you'd want to find worms for each of the three categories in your soil profile there's the epigeic worms which live near the, the surface and um, they're quite small and worms that you'll find in your compost they come for that group they're epigeic worms then there's endogeic worms which live in the upper soil surface um, and they feed on a lot of the organic matter as well and then there's a third group called anisec uh, worms, which are deep burrowing. Um, the feed on surface litter 
as well, but they're good at pulling it deep down and through the soil profile, and they'll leave great big burrows. So they, they really, really do help soil structure and help uh, water to drain through your soil and so on and so forth. If you're interested more in worms, there's a good um, key or all the worms that you're likely to find in your soils in Britain. It's, uh, you can find it in the Farm Advisory Service website. It's called the Opal Key, the Opal Key, and it has all the British worms in it. And then this next slide was one that David put in for me. It's quite interesting in that uh, it shows the abundance of worms uh, depending on what's grown in the field. It compares grass only with a mixture of grass and clover with, with clover only. And it's interesting to see that the presence of clover has a significant impact on the worm numbers in that there's far more worms present in a clover only sward as there is with grass only. So I can only think that the worms are finding more to eat in that clover soils. Possibly linked to the nitrogen fixation that's going on with the clover. We can they're maybe taking uh, well, they're obviously taking more nitrogen out of the air and Possibly there's more protein and associated light forms linked to the nitrogen that's being captured. And it's, it's as you can see, it boosts the clover number. Uh, next slide, please, Margaret. So <clears throat> this is this is um, some soil on like in itself. It's tin for a field that's been in barley for three years. The structure of that soil was really good. Um, it was very friable. At a good organic matter level as well, um, it was over ten percent. I think over five percent is considered good, but this is over ten, which would hark back to the fact that the firm's predominantly grassland. So when there's a lot of grass has been in the rotation, the organic matter builds up. Grass is permanent. Grass is really good for building up organic matter. The other thing we did in this field was we measured what's called the potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And it's an indicator of the capacity of the soil microbial community to convert or mineralize the nitrogen tied up in the organic residues in the plant available forms, such as ammonium. And it's really just an indication of the life that there is in the soil. And the higher the number, the more life there is. And the figure that we got in this field was 56.2. Um, there's um, a soil and nutrient network farm down in Kelso, and they measured this in their fields. Um, a lot of other fields were uh, were only um, used for arable cropping, and they were getting figures in their barley fields as low as 12.4. And they had one field of barley that was that had been grassed the previous year, and it was 53.6, which is less than what's in this field, and it was considered a fantastic level of PMN, as they call it. Um, so really, this field here is good. Um, it's good, good, got good organic matter levels. Um, it's got good um, mineralizable nitrogen levels, which indicates there's a lot of microbes. And there was um, also six worms we counted in this field too. I know the target ideally is to have more than nine, but it's certainly a lot more than three, which is considered poor. So bear in mind that it's an arable field. I think. Uh, I think the the assessment of biology in this field would deem that field to be quite good. Next field, Malcolm, quickly. Um, this is a field that's been in grass for over 40 years. Lots of fibrous roots, um, slight compaction issues, and that some of the soil's getting a bit aggregated and a bit blocky. Um, and the, this is the field that had the orange oxidized color in the room, some of the roots too, which would suggest that uh, the field was um, waterlogged at certain times of the year. But the worm numbers were really good. We counted 14 in, in this field and on average in a, in a soil spit length, which is really good. Carbon levels were really good too, 12.32. And the mineralizable uh, nitrogen was really, really high, 70.9. So that would all point to there being a lot of activity, a lot of life in the soil, which is uh, which is good. And I guess a reflection of the fact that um, there's there's not been any disturbance in the soil to reduce to reduce it, reduce the life that's in it. And then the next slide, please, Malcolm. Um, this is what I've called the poorest field. This is the field 
which, um, well, I couldn't find any worms in it. It's a field that's an agri environment and it's cut for um, corn crake silage in the 1st of September each year. It's heavy, claggy soil. Doesn't really get any fermier manure or um, slurry applied to it. There's no worms. At the lowest carbon level as well, 9.48, which is still good actually. It also, the fields we sampled on the farm at the lowest and um, potentially mineralizable nitrogen as well. Although, again, it was 58, which compared to the farm um, doing in cows, so it's a high figure, but it's um, the poorest out of the like in ones. Um, I guess the, the structure isn't helping things. Um, it's, it's that sodden and dense. I'm not surprised there was no worms in it. Another thing, whether it had anything to do with the worm couldn't, I don't know, but the field uh, not that long ago had an application of forefront T, so maybe that's had an impact on, on the worm couldn'ts, I don't know. The field also, the pH is slightly low, it's 5.7, and the calcium level is low as well, so possibly if it got some shale sand to, to raise the calcium level and to raise the pH, we might start finding more worm life in it, possibly, um, and that might also raise the and amount of microbes in it too. Uh, next slide, please, Malcolm. So, how do you increase the soil biology um, in a field? Well, any any tillage, plowing or power harrowing or anything like that is going to be disruptive. It's going to kill earthworms. It's going to break the fungal hyphae up. It's going to expose organisms to predators. It will reduce the biodiversity. Um, it'll also shift your food web, food web, sorry, to a more bacterial dominated one rather than a fungal one. But still, plowing is good. It's good for weed control. It removes compaction. Um, you know, there's, there's times when plow is really the only option. But maybe people could consider overseeding to improve grass swabs. swabs. Or possibly select more permanent grass seed mixtures to reduce the amount of times that the field needs to be plowed, possibly. Um, increasing the soil organic matter by adding more dung, slurry, crop residues, green manure. That's all going to benefit not only the biology in the soil, but the physical and chemical side of it as well. Um, trying to avoid bare soil, if possible, too, is going to help keep roots in the ground. To feed the biology, um, they hold on to the nutrients as well and maintain the soil structure. Um, maybe less applicable for Orkney, but folk could maybe consider cover crops um, like double neeps and stuff that people also and after a, a, a cereal's been harvested, something that's going to be growing roots that are going to be in the ground over the winter time. Diverse crop rotation rotations as well is going to um, help things. Um, diverse forms of organic matter is going to generate more biodiversity in the soil. And diverse plant species as well, with different root in depths. Um, I think David will maybe say more about this, but um, if there's a mixture of species in the swab and they've got different root in depths, they're possibly going to pull up different minerals through the soil profile. Um, and that, that's likely to help the biology as well. Um, avoiding excessive bagged fertilizer applications as well could be uh, something to think about. The symbiotic relationship between, the, as I mentioned before, the mycorrhizal fungi and the plants, it's going to reduce um, if lots of bagged fertilizer, particularly nitrogen, is applied. Um, it'll reduce the plant's dependency on the fungi. Um, excesses excessive acidifying fertilizers like ammonium nitrate as well if, if you can ease back in them that, that'll help it's really i mean the ipm is the is the word to do to use i guess integrated pest management when it comes to, con to controlling things that are um, affecting your crops less chemicals less fungicides if you can cut down fungicides in spring barley possibly that's going to help the soil biology i know chlorpyrifos is gone um, it's bound to be enhancing soil biology, I, sh I should imagine. Um, what the effect of forefront tree and tea and glyphosate on soil is questionable, but I can't think it's doing any good. Possibly weed wiping, spot spraying, the controlled dockings. Um, 
might might be something to to consider rather than blanket spraying. And maybe some docks are okay. I mean, they're deep rooted. They're going to pull up more minerals into into the uh, grass sward, which might help the livestock that's that's eating it. So the final slide. I need to rattle on here. It's basically it's just to highlight um, that good soil health is really an interaction between all three, between the biological, the physical, and the chemical properties of the soil. And to have soil that's in good health, you need to have a balance of all three. Um, it's historically, I guess, soil health improvements tended to concentrate on the physical and chemical properties. You know, bang on manure, sort your phosphate out. Um, but this, this still important, but uh, it's just the balance needs to be to be struck. I think. Um, so that's me. I'll pass over to to David now and let him take over. I think you've heard enough of me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Graham, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm David Lost. As Graham mentioned, I'm David Lost in Grasslands Specialist SRUC. Um, I'm talking to you today from Perth in in Scotland, in not Perth, Australia. Um, so we're, uh, what I want to discuss today is quite a few topics actually. Graham has asked me to talk on is the grass physiology, how the grass plant grows, and the clover grows as well. Looking at uh, some other alternative species, we've been looking at uh, rooting, etc. Rooting depth. What species could you use for helping getting rooting depth? And looking at some of the the, the species and the varieties of grass and clover being used at uh, liking, and to see as to why they've been chosen. Um, I may work to other little bits and bobs of some of the research we're carrying out as well. I'll, I'll, Finish with at the end. So to talk about, most of you will be familiar with this, uh, the grass plant that sits. Um, <clears throat> the, there's what we call sort of three living leaves on any grass plant, and you see that the, the, the top leaves are the youngest leaves. The leaves at the lower end are the older leaves, and the ones at the, the ends, the lowest leaf, tends to die off. So at any one time, you only have three actually living leaves. The fourth one is in the process of, of dying off. And we have what we call the main tiller growing from the base up, and the leaves come off or come uh, <coughs> grow through the tiller. So the top leaves actually grow through the tiller to the, the, the top. And the growing point, the important point of the grass and how it can be used for grazing is the growing point where all the new leaves and tillers come from. It's right at the very, very base. As long as that growing point remains intact, you can get new leaves and new tillers being grow growing. Now, normally, what happens is that the, the leaves grow, and with time, new tillers grow. We we'll call here a daughter tiller, and three new leaves will come off that, and so on and so on. You get new tillers being formed, and so that there's it's virtually new plants being formed all the time. And more tillers are formed, are more frequently formed when the light gets to the base of the, the crop of the grass herbage, so that under silage you don't get many tillers formed because the light doesn't tend to get to the, the base or under hay. Whereas with grazing, you get more tillers formed, you get that's got denser sward. And can't forget the roots. Um, the roots, if there's no leaf growth, Remember, the roots depend are totally dependent on the leaf growth for their existence. All their energy, all the sugar that goes to form the roots come from the grass leaf growth. So if there's very little growth uh, or if it's been constantly uh, grazed, um, it tends to inhibit the amount of root growth taking place. So if you always keep that in mind, that the roots are totally dependent on the, the leaf growth. OK, next slide, please, Malcolm. So generally speaking, this is a generalisation, but a new leaf will be produced within a tiller every six to 10 days in summer and every 20 to 25 days in winter. So during the main growing periods between six and 10 days, um, there's three, if you think about it, there's three leaves growing. So there's a turnover of leaves every about 30 days and about 30 days there's a complete turnover of leaves. And after that point, you're getting old dead leaf material being produced, obviously it's a longer period than winter. 
once a tiller is flowered, it, the main aim of the grass plant is trying to produce a flower. And once it's produced that flower, then it's seeded. No more leaves are produced on that tiller as dependent on the daughter tillers for further growth. So you take a perennial ryegrass sward, which is, you know, by its name is perennial. There's actually new tillers that are being formed that keep it perennial because the older leaves are, are dying off. When the flowering heads are cut, the, the vegetative growth result uh, uh, resumes by the develop, development of the tiller buds. So in many respects, when we talk about perennial ryegrass, it's actually a whole series of annual plants that are being produced from all the new tiller. Okay, next, please. So leaf production, production of the new leaf uh, is optimal between 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. So you don't often reach that in Scotland, but in parts of certainly uh, in parts south of Ireland and other uh, Europe you might get that in some you know, for prolonged periods during the summer. Leaf production is also increased by light intensity. So the more light there is, the quicker the leaves are produced. And so, but it's only marginally increased by nitrogen application. So N fertilizer doesn't really affect the number of leaves produced. Okay, next please. The leaf size, as, as the growing season increases, the size of the individual leaves increase. And it's increased by the temperature, increased by, interestingly enough, the reduction in light intensity. So if you're actually under shade, you get a, high, a bigger leaf size. It's mainly because the plant's trying to compensate for the lack of leaf. You might sometimes see that in, if you've got a lawn beside the house, where if you get some shade, you'll, you'll often see the grass actually grows taller or the leaves seem to be bigger. And it's simply that it's a reaction to the lack of light. It produces a bigger leaf. But it's very soft leaf. There's not much carbohydrate in it. Increases with day length, so longer day lengths, you get bigger individual leaf sizes. And this is increased by nitrogen application. So the effect of nitrogen being applied is to increase the size of the leaf, not the number of leaves. Okay, next please. <clears throat> okay, and year emergence, um, that's with the flower heads starting to be produced. It's again brought on by increasing day length and temperature. Most grasses, uh, will flower during May, June, so there's sort of late spring, late spring, early summer. Uh, but as you'll be aware, there are, we'll come on to this a bit later, um, they, are, uh, they do vary, some are early and some are later than others. And the quality of the grass is very much dependent on the, the plant's tendency to flower and when it flowers. Okay, thanks, next, please. <clears throat> okay, so that's just very briefly through grass physiology. Go on to, to white clover, um, which is very, becoming a more, more important component of uh, perennial swords in that it's, it's nitrogen fixing. It can help reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer being applied. It generally estimates that white clover can provide between, certainly in Scottish conditions, between 80 and 120 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen in a year. So it's quite significant amounts. If you see that the, 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 there's a creeping growth of the, the white clover plant, you see the, what they call stolon, which grows along and from which new leaf materials produced and also roots are produced. And the, where we're, we're seeing in the, the grass, the growing points are vital because that's where all the leaves, so the new, new tillers come from. In the, in the clover plant, this is stolon that's most important. And if you can keep the stolons intact and undamaged and vigorous, then you'll always get new clover growth taking place. Okay, next slide, please. So again, generally, clover leaves, the individual leaves live for about four to five weeks after emergence. So again, they grow, they, if they're not eaten, they'll just simply die off and get uh, recirculated back out into the soil. After the initial establishment, the stolons developed from buds at leaf axils, so there's actually new stolons get produced. So you'll see, actually see that if you look at clover growing in the sward, you'll see that the, the stolons growing across the surface. They'll, they'll then branch to form new stolons. Um, and these nodes also, the, the stolons, petioles, and roots develop as well. There's, there's trigger mechanisms as to whether they produce a new stolon, a new leaf, or new roots at these, these little nodes. 
So the original clover plant, which you put in a seed, usually dies after one or two years, and stolons then become independent. So you could plant uh, clover at one corner of a field, and eventually it will spread over the whole field. But the original plant will die off. That to the clover within the field is, is, is derived and be genetically similar to that original plant. Uh, but it's one of the reasons you of, often see the clover kind of a bit patchy in the field, in that um, the, as the older ones die and new ones become established, you can give an appearance of being a bit patchy. You don't tend to get 100% cover in any one field. And one of the things, I don't know if anybody's seen this, at, uh, where you have clover in the field, there are some years where clover can be incredibly vigorous and almost outcompete the grass in growth. And there's other years where it really seems to struggle. And I have to say, nobody really quite knows why as to whether it's conditions to do with some sort of nematode activity in the soil uh, or what is actually going on. Generally speaking, we look towards the optimum is always seen as being 30% cover of the, 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 gr the ground cover being clover and 70% grass is always seen as being the optimum. When you look down in, in mid-June, it's always been seen as being the optimum, 30% cover. And if you got that, that's probably your optimum. Okay, next, please. <clears throat> so the stola, as I said before, if you can keep the stolons there in the growing across the surface of the soil, um, you, you'll always have clover there. So higher temperatures help in the stolon production. You do get some stolon loss in winter, although um, it's known that they actually burrow into the soil under cold temperatures. So you might not actually see them. But they're, they're actually under, under the ground in winter conditions. Light also uh, improves stolon growth. Um, flowering reduces the amount of stolon growth. So if, you, if the clover goes to a large amount of flowering, it will actually reduce stolon growth. The resources are going towards flowering and stolon production. And smaller leaved clover varieties are more stoloniferous. So the smaller ones, which you normally use for grazing purposes, smaller leaf white clovers. Will also encourage stolon activity, whereas large leaved uh, clovers don't have as much stolon activity. Um, some of the larger leaved clover varieties now are huge, you get huge, huge leafed uh, varieties now, but tend not to be so good for grazing, better for, for silage and, and hay. Okay, next, please. Okay, and I've got obviously the, the important factor with regard to. White clover, and what, one of the, reasons, the main reasons in the sward is that it can uh, can fix nitrogen from the air. And if you dig down, you'll see these little white nodes, uh, or so, should be slightly pinkish if they're working, nodes in the the ground and on the the roots. And this is the bacterial association um, that was like Graham was talking about earlier, whereas the where the, the roots and the bacteria combine to form these little um, nodules and the bacteria, they produce uh, ammonium which goes into the plant and the roots, the clover can take it up. At the same time, the clover provides sugars for the bacteria to exist. And it's quite a remarkable um, symbiotic relationship, which obviously if there's a sort of thing you could do for other crop plants, for wheat, barley, rice, etc. If you could actually um, provide the same sort of bacteria for these, then we could have you could reduce the nitrogen fertilizer requirements for cereals to some extent. I think I vaguely remember the research been starting out in this in the 1960s, if not before, on looking at getting nitrogen fixation in barley and wheat, and they haven't succeeded yet. It's such a, a it's almost intimate um, because the, the, the bacteria is specific species of bacteria for specific species of clover. And they have to be in that one relationship. They, they can't swap to other plant species or even sometimes either the clover species. So it's very difficult to actually induce another plant species. I'll just go to the next slide, please. And for nitrogen fixation by the bacteria, they actually require fairly high pH. One of the reasons for the clover requires a slightly higher pH than most grasses, probably up to maybe 6.2, up to 6.5. They have quite a high requirement for phosphates. You have to really, to get optimum fixation, you require 
phosphate. You also require potassium as well, low should put potassium in as well. Probably slightly higher than what the grass would need for its own needs. And trace elements are important, including iron is important, and molybdenum is the, the second element there. <clears throat> and just to indicate how um, the whole process of mixing nitrogen for uptake by clover is incredibly sophisticated. If you keep in mind that the, the producing ammonium fertilizer in uh, by the what's called Born Harbor process requires huge temperatures and huge pressures and huge amounts of energy. Um, and yet the, the these bacteria can do this at 20, 20 degrees or even or even lower. Um, but it's, it's very intricate. And just to mention the trace elements required, one is including iron. And so iron, if you look at the nodules, they tend to be slightly pink in colour. That's because of that there's iron present there. It gives it a slight reddish, pinkish colour. And the reason the iron is there is to mop up oxygen. This whole nitrogen fixation process can't work if there's oxygen around. So the, the, the iron is there to actually mop up oxygen and stop it getting to the bacteria. So you can see if there's not enough iron there in the soil, then the process won't work. So there's a lot of things have to come together for it to, to work. And other things with the temperature as well. It really only starts going at 10 degrees Celsius. So with the clover may be growing, the grass will certainly be growing at temperatures below that. So the, the nitrogen fixing may not kick in until the soil temperature reaches about 10 degrees. And that's one of the reasons we often say to put just a even in clover uh, source of a good clover cover in spring, maybe just put a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer to get the grass going before the, the bacteria kick in and start fixing the nitrogen. Okay, next please. Okay, well, it <laughs> very briefly again covers clover physiology. And just to get um, a look at some of the, the grasses and using the grass mixtures and lichen, um, I mentioned most of these grasses and varieties are actually what called first choice grass varieties. It's for Scotland. I think they're all, they all are actually. I'll just mention this one of my main jobs is to produce the, the grass and clover varieties list for Scotland. This goes to all the, or most of the seed trade in Scotland. They actually pay for this to get carried out. And there's a whole range, or there's all the information for individual uh, species and varieties. They're all being tested under Scottish conditions at three sites. And so these are all, uh, most of the, 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 the mixes contain these. And one of the things, the first thing you see is there's a huge range of varieties there. And the, first of all, the main reason for putting in the intermediate and late varieties of perennial ryegrass, and this would be ideal for grazing, because as I mentioned before, they all have different heading dates, they have different flowering dates. And so the, their quality, once you get past the flowering date, the quality of the grass tends to decline in terms as the more fiber produced, there's less sugar produced. So you want them growing at different heading dates. So there's a range of their optimum quality. And so you get intermediate ones, plain rye grass in themselves will be at different heading dates and late as well, which obviously flower later on in the year. We do get early plain rye grasses as well. But there's not so many of these on the market now. Um, so the other, another point, to note is a 20% tetraploid content. The big advantage of tetraploid is it's more vigorous growing, it's a higher sugar content, and it's much more cold tolerant than the, the diploid ones. It can withstand frosts and frost damage much better than the, the diploid ones. And we do have a winter testing um, in Scotland to, to test that out for the all the individual varieties. Some are better than others, but generally speaking, tetraploids are much more winter tolerant than the normal diploids. Going down the list, uh, we have Comer Timothy. Timothy is normally put in where we think there could be sort of wet soil conditions. That's where its main advantage is. It's not so it's slow to establish. It doesn't have such a high quality in terms of energy and uh, for the, uh, the, the stock. But it's usually there just as a precautionary measure in case you get very wet soil conditions. And then we come on to the, the white clover. As I mentioned, again, we have a range of, of clovers. Medium 
what uh, leaf size again ideal for grazing and especially the small however if you're going to be grazing the sward you've got to make sure that there's a, a substantial amount of small white clover there as well it uh, withstands grazing the large leaf ones don't withstand grazing very well one thing just to mention with regard to management is that if the sward is closely grazed constantly and there's not any recovery of growth, the, the clovers will stop actually fixing nitrogen. The, the bacteria will stop uh, providing nitrogen by fixation. It's just uh, simply because they're not getting resources from the, the clover leaf. Okay, next grass mixture. Um, okay, thanks. I think it's fairly similar, actually. It's a fairly similar story. There's one or two, probably some newer, one or two newer varieties come on there. One thing, just to mention, the, the, these are all recommended varieties within the, the, the testing system. There are quite a number of varieties just don't go on to the, the, the Scottish recommended list, and um, and the ones that do go on can be quite different to ones that go on to the English and Welsh and indeed the Northern Ireland's recommended list. So the, because they're tested under Scottish conditions, uh, we know that they will perform well in Scotland. Um, these are pretty, actually fairly similar. They're just a word to, I think it's one to newer ones um, on the list. But again, with Timothy there as well. So I think we're looking at this a similar sort of thing. If we're looking at a a mix specifically for just simply for or mainly for silage, we probably wouldn't have such a wide range of heading dates uh, and varieties and heading dates because you, if you're cutting silage, you what you'd want your your sward to be fairly close to the optimum at the time of cutting. Uh, so you're cutting just probably just at flowering and certainly before it gets into its major flowering. Um, so, so you want it all relatively much at the same stage when you cut. Whereas for grazing, you would have a, a range of heading dates as, as we have here. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, one of the things that again we've been mentioning what's going on below ground. And one of the advantage one of the uh, advantages that there's a lot of interest at the moment in using multi-species swords and you know, to things like herbal lays, etc. And there's some work being done that's getting done at the moment. That has been work done in New Zealand in the past. And there's getting work done in England at the moment. And there's some there's small trials getting carried out in Aberdeenshire as well on herbal lays and the, the, their advantages with regard to the stock production um, and the vitality of the stock, etc. But one of the, the main issues uh, which Graham mentioned is that some of the individual plant species used in these herbal lays. The major advantage is they're very deep rooting. And this means that some of the, the nutrients that you may lose at the surface, especially the grass, is fairly short rooted, and especially, and especially if it's being grazed. Um, some of these nutrients that you've applied may get lost to the surface and go down to depth, things like potassium, potash, nitrogen, um, sulfate as well. And if you get things like um, Lucerne, well, maybe Lucerne, not so much, but if you could say coxfoot grass within the sward, chicory certainly, um, vetch as well, these are deep rooting and they can start bringing these nutrients back up into the surface. And the leaf material dies, or indeed is, the, is grazed by the animal, these get recirculated back onto the top of the soil. So it's a terrific way of actually capturing nutrients in depth and bringing them back up to the surface. These are it's quite a good diagram. This from Cotswold Seeds uh, to, to, to show this. But you can see that some of these are the ones I'm not sure if it's actually there, but uh, red clover is another one actually. White clover is not particularly great at uh, rooting depth. Yeah, yeah, is, is but red clover is red clover is much more. It's got a bit of a tap root, which can just put down to depth. White clover is totally poor actually rooting depth. Okay, next please. And this just this shows you again the, the, the idea of this, if you've got a range of these plants taking nutrients up at different depths, you get major advantage on recirculating nutrients. And it means you, your requirements are less 
There's also less chance of nutrient loss from the soil system uh, by using these. Okay, next, next please. And these are just some of the, the varieties or uh, pictures of, of some of the species that I've mentioned there. Sheep's parsley, next please. These are just pictures for your records, really. You can have a look at names later. Yarrow, most people know Yarrow is very deep rooting as well. Next, please. Again, just the plants, Kyron Burnett. Um, again, there's quite a lot of it. And, um, <clears throat> nobody's quite sure just what advantages some of these would have for the animal production. Certainly, chicory, there, there's the record to be some benefit to the animal from feeding on them. They certainly like, if you ever see a uh, sheep feeding on chicory, they certainly like it. Okay, next, please. Okay, so just, just last, while I'm here, just because uh, Graham mentioned that some of the other work we'll do, sorry, some research work in the moment in grassland. I thought I'd maybe just, just mention our two things that we're doing. Um, we've been carrying out some work in Aberdeenshire uh, with regard to nitrogen application, um, splitting nitrogen, because a lot of it, concern now about obviously nitrogen losses. I've been doing some work on splitting the nitrogen application. It's often recommended to ensure you get, if you're applying 120 kilogram per hectare of the nitrogen in the spring, is it better to split that? Um, and intuitively you would think yes it would be, but in fact we've found the opposite that uh, growth has actually been reduced. We've split it into 80 kilogram plus 40 kilogram applied later on. So we're looking in more detail at that as to as to when, if you are going to split the application, when's best to do that. So it's work getting carried on in that at the moment. As I say, some results were actually quite surprising on this. The other thing that uh, Graham mentioned, just just lastly, just to finish off with, we're doing some work in bioprocessing, whereby we're looking at uh, processing grass and indeed clover to extract protein directly without it going through the animal for human consumption and also processing it to other materials as well. So for instance, we've got using perennial ryegrass spores of process to produce things like this, some mats material you can hopefully see there. So quite strong pulling trying to pull this apart. And this was this is from extracted from there's a fiber material after the protein had been extracted. We get this sort of material potentially could have uses uh, for packaging, etc., uh, or other materials for papers being used. But there's other products come out, things like sugars, which can be used for alcohol production or indeed food production as well. So we're working on that at the moment. This very slow process uh, to, to develop this, but um, there's a number of people working on this in Dem Denmark, Germany, Holland, USA. There's quite a comp not competition, but um, there's a, a move to make this work commercially so that we're getting products directly and gives you alternative outputs from grassland and grass clover systems rather than just uh, sheep, milk and, and wool. So I think that finishes my talk. Um, I'm not sure if I'll we'll hand back, hand back over to, to Graham. If I can uh, just ask a couple of questions, David, whilst you're here. Um, somebody okay. has asked if we measured the Brex levels in any of the past years. My understanding is the Brex levels a measurement, or oh, is it the carbohydrate the sugar, in the plant? Yeah, yeah. sugar content. No, we, we don't uh, routinely. Um, I mean, we, when we're doing the variety testing work, we measure the, the ME the, at three three stages during growth, the, the, the ME metabolizable energy value, which is primarily dependent on the sugar content of the leaf. And the, there, are, there are varietal differences between, in fact, quite significant differences between uh, different varieties. So you can actually work out how much energy you have per hectare using the, these values, and some people do that. But we, don't, we don't directly measure the, the, the Brix value. Is that something we could, um, could do in the future? I think it's worthwhile, yeah. So another very briefly, where we were up, but just this will have to be the last question. Is the persistence um, or longevity taken into account when new grass varieties are being developed? 
Uh, good question. Um, and it's not really apart from we measure ground cover. Ground cover after after cutting, we measure ground cover to uh, which is a, gives a good good indication of how persistent the grass is going to be. They're, they're, they're actually tested over a three year period of conservation, uh, then under grazing, under the conservation. However, because of, basically because of that, that question, some of the plots have actually often crew have kept going now for seven years to, to look at the persistence of the grasses. And in fact, you find that the productivity we were getting in the first year actually persists into the seventh year. We're in, last year was the seventh year and persistence is still there. It's still as productive as they were in the first year. Because primarily because we're making sure that they're being weed, the plots are being weeded to make sure there's no weed activity. Um, there's nothing competing with the grasses. So it's a fairly good indication that they do keep the, the persistence under um, if they're managed in such a way. And to, to be fair, they are, they're managed quite intensively at the, the trial plots. That's fine, David. Thank you very much for that. I'm just conscious of the fact that we're our slots right, um, okay. up. Uh, I'll just have to say, well, thanks, David, for joining us. Um, thanks to everybody who's logged in. Thanks also to the host farmer, Mr McGuckin and uh, Kieran at Lycan. Thanks again. Hope you all have a good uh, Christmas and uh, a better New Year. Okay, thank you very much. Cheerio.